Well, good morning again. A special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. Before we jump into the message today, I just wanted to say from myself personally a big thank you to everybody who committed to, towards our forward initiative over the last a uh, couple weeks. Um, we know that more commitments are still going to come in, and we've already been getting people asking the question, how much came in? And so like we said in the video announcements, we're going to reveal that on April 16th. Um, if you have a commitment card with you this morning, you can drop it off at the Connection Center. There's a little box just to the left of that that you can put it in there. So again, we're really excited about what's ahead. And just again, thank you for everybody who's taken that step forward with our church. So it was, a, it was about this time last year that Becky and I and our family were getting away for spring break, and last year we went to the mountains of North Carolina. We had some friends from Atlanta who had a house in the mountains, and they said, hey, just come spend the week with us, come hang out, we'll have a good time. And so we said, sure, why not? It's a free place to stay. We had no idea what we were going to, but we were blown away by the location. It was on the top of a mountain right outside Bryson City, and this is a picture of the home. And and, and the home was great, but was re- what was really spectacular was the view. It was literally on the top of a mountain, and you could get a 360 view of the North Carolina mountains around this house. So if you turned around from the picture right there, like if I, I took that picture, right? So if I turned and showed you the other side, it was this. It was just, it was more mountains. It was mountains upon mountains upon mountains. It was one of the most beautiful places I have been to in a long, long time. Now, on the bottom of this mountain was the Nantahala River. And at the bottom, they had this, what they called the outdoor center. There's all kinds of things happening at the bottom of this mountain along the Nantahala River. There was like a restaurant there. They had a little general store. They had an outfitter store where you could buy camping gear. And the reason why they had all that stuff there is because the bottom of the mountain ran right along the Appalachian Trail. So you would see hikers who are hiking the trail come off the trail, they'd stop at the general store, they'd get a bite to eat at the restaurant. They also had these patios all along the river where you could just sit and enjoy the river. You could go kayaking and whitewater rafting, launched from there. It was, it was really great. So every afternoon, we would just go down to the river, hang out, let the kids run around and explore the river. And there were people coming and going. People come off the trail, and the vibes of this place were really good because people were just happy to be in nature. Hikers were happy to be coming off the trail, and we're sitting there one afternoon just enjoying the beauty and enjoying this place, and Becky goes, you know, we should hike the Appalachian Trail. And I said, what? She's like, yeah, wouldn't that be great? I was like, the Appalachian Trail runs from Georgia to Maine. It's 2,200 miles long. It it takes people six months to hike it. They train for a year or more. She's like, oh, I know, but wouldn't it be fun? I was like, "I, I don't know if I would call that fun. Now, the interesting thing about this bridge that you can see, like that was... That literally was part of the Appalachian Trail. So I took her to the bridge. We walked across the bridge. And I was like, there, you hiked part of the Appalachian Trail. We can check that off the list. But what was happening in that moment was that she was caught up in the atmosphere of where we were, right? Because it was just this great spot. It was beautiful. There was good vibes there, lovely people. And she fell in love with the idea of hiking the trail. Because you would see hikers come off the trail just ecstatic and overwhelmed, like, I, I've made this leg. And they're so happy because they're off the trail, right? Because they've completed part of their goal. They can sit down and have a hot meal, take a shower or something. Because having the idea of, of liking or liking the idea of hiking the trail is very different than hiking the trail. Like, it's easy to like the Appalachian Trail in that setting, but when you're in the middle of the trail and a rainstorm comes through and your tent gets a hole in it and you wake up soaking wet and you're 23 days into eating the same dried food over and over and you can't get a fire started because all the wood's wet, that's a very different scenario than sitting by a river and enjoying nature, watching happy hikers come off the trail, right? And sometimes we find ourselves in those situations where we like the idea of something more than we really like the actual thing, 
right? We like the idea of something more than the actual thing. About 10 years ago, uh, Becky's sister and her daughter lived with us for a season, and I remember having a conversation with our niece about wanting to learn how to play the guitar. And I'm not a great guitar player. I know about four or five chords, but I can strum and I can teach people some chords. I was like, hey, I'll teach you. I'll teach you how to play a few chords. And so we sat down one day, and she's like, this is hard, because you've got to get your hands to move in different directions. You've got to push hard down on the strings. And over the course of the next few weeks, she kept talking about wanting to learn how to play the guitar, but she never picked up the guitar. And I was like, have you practiced today? Have you done anything today? And she would talk about wanting to learn songs and sing, but she never actually did it because it was hard and uncomfortable. She fell in love with the idea of playing the guitar, but didn't really want to play and do the hard work to learn how to play the guitar. So sometimes we can fall in love with the idea of something more than the actual thing. And I think that's true of following Jesus as well. Sometimes it's easy to fall in love with the idea of following Jesus. Because we come to church on a certain Sunday, and we're just, we love being in this place. We enjoy grabbing a cup of coffee, putting our kids in childcare, and then just, oh, I got an hour to myself, and I'm encouraged by what's said and the music. Or maybe we're in a stressful season of life, and it feels like following Jesus helps alleviate the stress that I'm feeling and feeling overwhelmed. But when I go out into the world, and I'm, and I'm called to actually do the things that Jesus calls us to do, to actually walk in the way that Jesus calls us to walk, it can be a very different thing. It's easy to fall in love with the idea of following Jesus and like that idea, but it's very different than actually following him. And so the question for us this morning is, is that happening to us? Do we like the idea of following Jesus more so than really, truly following him. And our passage today explores that idea. This is how our passage begins. This is Luke 9, starting in verse 51. Luke writes, As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, him being Jesus, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Now, this moment in Luke's gospel, gospel is pivotal. It is the turning point of the book, because in this moment it says that Jesus is about to make a trip to Jerusalem. And this isn't a casual trip. It isn't a spontaneous, hey, let's just go. This is a trip that Jesus is determined to take. It has purpose. Did you notice what Luke said? He resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Like nothing is going to deter him from getting to Jerusalem. The actual literal Greek face, uh, phrase here is that he set his face towards Jerusalem. Jesus set his face. Have you ever set your face to something before? Right? It means you're determined. Nothing will deter you from getting to where you're going. If you've ever been driving in bad weather, like yesterday in the morning, if you tried to get out and go run to this door, like you set your face to wherever you are going, and you are determined to get there because the roads are treacherous and it snows all over the place. Like you're just determined. In the morning, when I get out of bed, I set my face on the coffee pot. Like I am determined. <laughs> To get there, nothing will veer me off course. Jesus is determined to get to Jerusalem. This trip is so important that Luke structures his entire gospel around this trip. The, the narrative structure of Luke's gospel has three major parts. A, apart from Jesus' birth, chapters 1 and 2, there are three major sections in Luke's gospel. The first section is chapter 3 through chapter 9, where Jesus is ministering in the region of Galilee. That's the red circled area on this map. But here in chapter 9, there is a pivotal moment where it says Jesus is now headed for Jerusalem. The second section in Luke's gospel is the journey that Jesus takes to Jerusalem, chapters 9 through 19. And then once he arrives in Jerusalem, in chapter 19, the last section is the ministry that he does from chapter 19 to chapter 
24, which is the final week of his life. So you'll notice that this journey to Jerusalem is the largest, longest part of his gospel. And along the way in that section, there are three markers and reminders that Jesus is on this trip. Like it says in chapter 13, verse 22, that Jesus went through towns and villages teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. It says in chapter 17, verse 11, now Jesus, again, on his way to Jerusalem. It says a chapter later in chapter 18, verse 31, Jesus is speaking to the disciples and he says, remember, we are going where? To Jerusalem. So the significance of of this section, in part, is about the destination and what Jesus is going to do when he arrives in Jerusalem. Because he will spend a few days teaching in the temple courts, but ultimately, his purpose in going to Jerusalem is to die, is to be executed, rejected by his people, and die on the cross to take on the sin, brokenness, death, and destruction of the entire world. We are two-ish weeks away from Easter. We have Easter in view, but before Easter comes Good Friday, Jesus went to Jerusalem to die. But this section, as the readers, knowing that's Jesus' destination, this section poses a question to us. And the question is, would you, will you follow Jesus? On that journey to Jerusalem, ultimately to the cross, to die, would you, will you follow him? Because as Jesus starts this journey, one of the very first things that happens is that he has three interactions with three different individuals who seem to like the idea of following Jesus. But in these three interactions, Jesus gives three challenges to them to see, do they really want to follow him? Do they like the idea of it, or do they really want to follow him? So if we jump ahead to verse 57... This is what we read. As they were walking along the road, again, highlighting the fact that they're traveling to Jerusalem, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. So there's definitely some eagerness from this guy. He he has the appearance of being sold out. Jesus, wherever you go, I'm right there with you. Jesus, wherever you go, I will never leave your side. Jesus, wherever you go, I am all in. To which you might think Jesus would say, yeah, come on, let's go. But he says this, verse 58, foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Great. You want to come follow me? Jesus' first challenge is that following him challenges the comfort and convenience that we like in life. Anybody here like comfort and convenience? I do. Yeah, I do. Yeah. But Jesus says, it's, it's not going to be easy. You want to follow me? Great. It, it's not going to be easy. It might even be the hardest thing you've ever done. So please do come, but know what you're signing up for, he says. It, and this can be unsettling for us because as a culture, like we are conditioned for convenience. We are conditioned for things to be easy. One of the new things that I love when I like, I'm at the store and I pay for something. I love wireless payment, right? Like I take my card out and I just touch it, and all of a sudden I've paid for something. Amazing! Like done, right? And so I'm finding myself now at Metro Market because they don't have the wireless touch thing. Like I find myself going to pay and I just start touching the thing, and I'm touching the thing. And I'm touching the thing. I'm like, this isn't going through. I'm touching the thing, right? Because you have to swipe at Metro Market. They don't have the wireless payment yet. Or maybe you found yourself going to wash your hands and you put your hands under a faucet and you start waving them around (laughs) and nothing happens because it's not an automatic sink. It's a turn sink or a button you got to push, right? Like we are just, like our culture is shaping us 
for things to be easy. And so sometimes we bring that expectation into our faith. Like, this is going to be easy. It's going to be a walk in the park. I'm encouraged when I read the scripture. So, yes, I want to follow Jesus. And he's like, hey, this isn't a walk in a park. This is a hard, hard road at times. Now, from there, Jesus has another exchange. And while the last one was initiated by the individual, this one is initiated by Jesus. And he says in verse 59, follow me. He said to another man, follow me. But he, this other man, replied, Lord, let me first go bury my father. Now, at first glance, that seems like a reasonable request from this guy, right? Like his dad has just died. He has yet to bury him. And so it's like, let him grieve, let him pay his respects, and then he'll come follow Jesus. Because in ancient Jewish culture, grieving the death of a loved one was a big deal. I mean, to start, you were considered unclean, and so you, you had to like be secluded for a certain number of days. But there were also moments in the Old Testament when somebody died where people would grieve for seven days. There are other scenarios where people would grieve for 30 days, and these were considered sacred days of grieving for the one you just lost. And there were situations when people would die in ancient Jewish culture that it wasn't just the family, the immediate family that would participate in the grieving, but the whole community would participate in the grieving. Grieving in ancient Jewish culture was a huge deal. And so you would think that Jesus would be understanding of this guy's situation, right? In part because there are different stories in the Gospels where Jesus comes upon somebody who is grieving, and he steps into their grief, and he engages with them with tenderness and compassion and care. There's a story in Luke 7, a few chapters before this, where he's walking into a town called Nain with a bunch of his disciples. Coming out of Nain is a grieving widow. She has already lost her husband on the stretcher behind her. It's her only son, and the entire community is with her. And Jesus stops everybody dead in their tracks. It says his heart went out to her. He had compassion for her. He looks her in the eye, and he says, oh, no, 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 no. Don't, don't worry. Don't grieve. Take heart. And he raises the son from the dead. Like, he knows how to enter in to people's grief. J Jesus, we read in John 11, also experiences his own grief. He gets word that his good friend Lazarus has died, and he goes to the tomb, and he sees Mary, and he just falls apart, and he weeps, not only because of her grief, but because of his own, because his friend has died. So you would think that when this guy says, hey, let me go bury my dad, Jesus would say, I get it. Go, and then come follow me. But he says, oh, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God, which is a bit jarring, don't you think? Which either Jesus is a bit of a jerk in this moment, or something else is happening. Something else is going on. And some scholars speculate that, that maybe this guy's father isn't actually dead. What he's saying is, hey, how about I wait till my dad passes, which who knows how many years that could be. I have this obligation to my family, and then once he passes and I go through the grieving season, then I'll come following you. Because maybe he feels obliged to take care of his parents, because again, in ancient Jewish culture, family was everything. It was your security. It was your safety net. It was how you did life continually, and there's this expectation, a cultural expectation in Jewish culture that you would honor your father and mother, right? It's in the Ten Commandments, the fifth of the ten. Jesus says plainly, or God says plainly, honor your father and mother, which means not only is Jesus challenging our sense of comfort, He's also challenging our culture, meaning the kingdom of God supersedes culture. It is the greatest story of who God is and what he's doing. And Jesus regularly, he's Jewish, he's from Jewish culture, but he regularly challenges Jewish culture, both with laws of cleanliness, what's clean and unclean, religious practices and rituals like not necessarily honoring the Sabbath in the way that the religious leaders thought he should, and then here with this guy's parents. 
Because there was this cultural expectation that you would take care of your parents. There were no senior living facilities in first century ancient Judaism. It was the family that did the work. And also for this guy, his inheritance might be wrapped up in his obligation to his family. If I ditch out on my family, they're going to cut me out of my inheritance. And I want that. I need that. That's going to help me later in life. And see, for a first century Jew, it would be hard to discern where to let go of certain cultural practices to follow Jesus because their culture and their religious practices were all intertwined. It wasn't distinct and separate like us in our culture where we say there's a separation of church and state, but Jesus is regularly challenging the culture of first century Judaism. And he regularly challenges us in our culture as well. Because not only are we shaped by comfort, which comes from our culture, there are all sorts of other ways that our culture shapes how we view the world. Success is a big one. And I'll be honest to say, I have been wrestling through this huge over the last few months. Because I've been asking myself the question, as we step into this new season of ministry, behind this forward initiative, as we've raised funds to renovate our facility, the question surfaces for me, what is success in that? Like, how do I know that I, that we as a church, have been successful by what we do? Is it that we raise the money and we meet our fundraising goal? Is that we do everything all at once? What if we have to face it? What if we come short? Like, these are real things that I've been wrestling with. What does it mean to be successful in following Jesus? What does it mean to be successful in leading the church? Is it you're always growing? You're always getting bigger? You're always getting more efficient? Or is success based on a totally different matrix. And so we have to ask ourselves that all the time. Like, is our culture shaping us more than the kingdom of God and his values and his priorities and his call to take the low position, his call to inconvenience yourself, his call to not be identified by what you have and own in your possessions, but to give your life away for the sake of a greater story? So in following him, Jesus challenges our comfort, and he also challenges our culture. And then in this moment, he has one more interaction with one more individual in verse 61. Still another said to him, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Now, when we hear that response, it might think, lead us to think that Jesus is saying, don't go home and say goodbye. Just right here on the spot, come follow me. But Jesus doesn't say, don't go home and say goodbye. He says, anybody who puts their hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit. Meaning, maybe he knows that if this guy goes home and he talks to his family, his family will talk him out of going and following Jesus. Because for us, it's always easy to look back. So much of our identity comes from where we belong, right? And when you're younger, it's your family. You belong to your family. Your family gives you a sense of identity. As you get older, we look to all of these other things to give us a sense of identity. Our accomplishments, our jobs, what we do, where we go. Where we belong gives us a sense of identity. And what Jesus is doing here is he's calling this man to a new identity. He's calling him to a new allegiance. And he's saying, if you get sucked back into your old identity, your old allegiance, it will be that much harder for you to follow me because I'm doing something new. I don't know if anybody here has ever had to wrestle through doing something because you think it's what other people want you to do, right? Whether it's your family and you're like, I got to go down this career path because it's expected of me. Or in your job, I got to make this decision because it's what people expect of me. Or it's, hey, I'm part of this, you know, certain group of people and this is the way this group of people thinks about things and behaves around things. So, you know, I do that because that's what's expected of me. So not only is Jesus challenging our comfort and our culture, he's also challenging our sense of connection of where and to whom we belong that gives us a sense of identity that shapes how we think about ourselves and the world around us. And so you have these three individuals who come to Jesus, and it appears 
that they like the idea of following him because two of three approach him. It also seems to be that they have an understanding of who he is because they call him the Lord, right? Indicating, yes, he is the Messiah. He is the Savior. He's come to rescue us. They pursue Jesus. They have a sense of who he is, but Jesus seems to challenge their desire to follow him. Like, do you, do you really want to do this? Because we're going to wander around and we're not going to have a place to stay. Do you re- it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be comfortable. Like, we're going to do things that go against the grain of what's expected of you, and you might find your own family rejects you. Do, do you really want to sign up for this? Now, what's interesting is that in each of these exchanges, we, we don't know what the three individuals do. Because in each exchange, Jesus has the last word, and we don't know if they go back on what he says, or if they say, yep, I'm up for the challenge. But what it seems as though, again, this passage is doing, is it's putting the question in front of us, the reader, how would you respond? How would you respond when it comes to following Jesus, knowing that it's hard, it's difficult, it it challenges your understanding of how to live, and you might have to relearn things. Essentially, what Jesus is saying to these guys and he's saying to us is don't flippantly follow. Like, don't think this is an add-on to my life. Don't think, oh, this is just something I do when it's convenient for me, or this is something I do for me, or this is something I do for self-improvement, or this is some self-actualization sort of program. Jesus is saying, no, 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 this this is about reorienting your entire life life. And you might have to relearn everything that has been both shaped in you and what you know to be true about reality. And there's a story in between the moment where it says in verse 51 that Jesus resolutely sets out for Jerusalem. And then in 57, verse 57, where Jesus has this three interactions with three guys, there's this short little story of the very first thing that happens on their trip. Back up a few verses to verse 52. And he sent messengers on ahead. So it says Jesus set out for Jerusalem. Then he sends messengers on ahead to get things ready, right? Who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. So Jesus goes to Samaria. Now, if you know anything about Jew and Samaritan relations in the first century, they were not kind. They were enemies. They were at odds with each other. So it's not unusual that Samaritans would reject Jesus. So Jesus says, right, this isn't going to be easy. And initially, they face opposition. But then in this moment, two of the disciples want to fall back on their culture and their connections, right? Because we're Jews. We don't like Samaritans. We think we're better than Samaritans. And so two of the disciples say this to Jesus, verse 54. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, I imagine they're really excited about this. Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? Like, we could do that, Lord. You have given us power and authority over all things. Let's show these suckers who's boss. Let's light them up and blow them out of the water, right? That would be a great way to make your mark in Samaria, right? And I just, I can imagine Jesus saying, like, oh my gosh. Like, we have so much work to do. Because he says, in verse, it says in verse 55, but Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples just went on to another village. So in that one interaction, like it's not easy. They, they face opposition right away. And then their impulse based on their culture and their connection, because we don't like Samaritans. They're dirty half-breeds. They want to invoke retaliation. They experience opposition and their first thought is retaliation. And we live in a world that I would say shapes that mentality in us. We live in a divided world, more divided than maybe any of us have ever seen in our lifetime. 
And it's like what people want to do is they want to draw lines, they want to pick sides, they want to pick fights, and they just want to cancel everybody, destroy everybody, and show how everybody else is worse than they are. And Jesus is like, no, 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 that, that's not what we're about. You go to the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus says, the way you treat your enemy is not by calling down fire from heaven to blow them to smithereens or to pray for their failure, but you love them. You practice loving them and extending yourself to them. I was watching an, um, a friend of mine posted something on Facebook this week, and it was this short clip of an interview of two guys who were on the different political pers- uh, perspectives on this issue. There was an interviewer and the interviewee, and you could just see, and I was very sympathetic towards the position of the interviewer, right? I, like, I kind of found myself thinking, like, yeah, I think you're right, but you could, like, see the anger and the disdain on his face. It was like the questions he was asking was just simply trying to bait this guy to say something that would go viral and then everybody would cancel him and he could say, I won, right? That's the way our culture operates. And Jesus is trying to challenge our culture. He's trying to challenge our connections, the tribe that we associate with that elevates themselves and ourselves above everybody else to say, no, 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 remember, we're going to Jerusalem. And remember what happens in Jerusalem. Jesus actually tells the disciples straight up, I'm going to Jerusalem to die. I'm not going to incite a war. I'm not going to overthrow Rome with a battle. I'm going to die for the people who are going to kill me. Like, that's what following Jesus is all about. So we don't flippantly follow. This isn't just a self-moral boost, a little self-actualization encouragement. The question for us is, are we willing to walk that road with Him? It may not physically, literally cost you your life, but it could very well put you in places of discomfort. It could challenge what you think you know to be true about how the world works and who God is. And it certainly could challenge the connections and the identity that you get from those connections. So the question is, do you want to follow? Do you like the idea of following Jesus? Or do you really want to follow him? Now, we know the end of the story. And we know that the end of the story ends in resurrection So even though it's hard, is it worth it? Oh, you better believe it. Because in the end, Jesus makes all things new. So all the pain, all the brokenness, all the opposition, all the sin, as we want to deny ourselves to follow Him, we have hope and courage because we know that in the end, Jesus has this crazy ability to take on death, suffering, and beat it, and win to make all things new. So, do you want to follow? Do you like the idea of following Jesus, or are you really willing to follow? It it will cost you almost everything at times, but what you receive in the end will be far greater than you could ever imagine. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for who you are, for what you've done, and how you continually in love lead us and challenge us. Lord, I pray that we would be able to see with eyes of faith in situations where we, like these disciples, want to retaliate where the call is to love, where we want to blow people away, that we would be willing to put ourselves in inconvenient positions to communicate and proclaim the kingdom to them. So, Lord, we ask that you would help us do that because it is far more challenging than we could simply say. Help us walk that road and live that life. We pray this in your name. Amen.